Welcome back to Your View. Thanks for staying with us. So I had a one-on-one -on -one with the Honorable Minister of Power, Housing and Works. I was curious about his views on the imminent cabinet shakeup and the intoxicating influence of incumbents. We also touched on his relationship with Governor Ambode. You don't want to miss this. Watch. Welcome to Your View with Moriah. On this segment, I have with me the Honorable Mis Minister for Power, Works and Housing and the former Governor of Lagos State, Honorable Babatunde Raji Fashola. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. First, I'd like to say congratulations to you and your party for successful elections. How did that make you feel? Well, it's done and dusted, so we're back to work. Um, we all worked hard. Uh, all members of the party, the leadership, the planning committee, and everybody. And uh, right. um, it's all behind us now, Fantastic. and I think that it's good to get back on track. To right. Sir, we heard that there's an imminent cabinet shakeup and that the president is likely to let go of many of the ministers. If you are affected, is there a particular ministry you'd like to serve, or do you think you'd retain your job as Minister of Power Housing? No, uh, these are matters of extreme speculation, and I don't indulge myself in, in such matters. This is the prerogative of the president. So let's deal with his decision, rather than agonize over how he exercises his but Let me say that people have said you have a way with words and you're a good communicator, that you might be good as a minister of information and culture. Do you think that would be something that fits your profile? Look, I won't agonize myself about the president's prerogative. Okay. Let him exercise his powers and we'll deal with it thereafter. Let me go into the issue of public service because um, the recent elections brought to fore again why lots of governors and incumbents was to retain power at all costs or try to have anointed candidates. We saw it at your time. We were told that, oh, your anointed candidate at the time was that was uh, Shasuri. And now we saw in Imo State, Governor Korocha saying, oh, he wanted his in-law. We've seen different governors trying hard to hold on to power or at least influence who the next governor is. What causes this intoxication? Or do you think it's just a dare need to continue what they started? Why do we have to have this repeating itself? I think, first of all, um, it is not true that I had an anointed candidate. Okay. The media chose to believe without investigating what was thrown at it. Okay. Members of my cabinet will confirm repeatedly how they asked me who I wanted and how I kept insisting that the party, must, the candidate must emerge from the primaries of the candidate. If I wanted a candidate, it was difficult to conceive that anybody could stop me. Yeah. But I recognized that this was a public trust. And my time was done, and I was ready to go anyway. And um, I'd run my race as hard as I could. So waiting one more day, there was nothing else I could usefully add. Yeah. And um, I also felt that it was important to allow the system to produce a candidate rather than choosing. Because in all of the cases where people have sort of tried to impose right. their own success, or they've, history has shown they've fallen out. Yeah, right. They've all fallen out. And it is almost true, too, even in your own family business, and you put your son there. His methods of running the company are not exactly going to be your methods. Right. Right. And inevitably, you will fall out. And the brands that have endured, the great brands that have lasted a century and more, have been because they have allowed other influences to come into them. All right, let me go to your relationship. I mean, you, people have asked you this question several times on your relationship with the current governor of Lagos State. And you've been very modest about it. Um, but I'd like to ask you the difference between your, your own system and his own way. Mm. Uh, initially, there was, the, there was the story of, oh, everything Fashola did, he just stopped it. Governor Abode has stopped it. But the people who he governs are saying, listen, yes, he might have stopped Lagos Homes, or for whatever reason, but there are other projects he's done, the laybys, the electricity, lighting up the entire expressway. So for us, the people, it was a continuation. 
but the political class of whatever felt that there was still some kind of tension between the two of you. But did that tension exist? And what have you done to help ease the tension today? There was no tension. You see, I've looked at succession models across the world. Okay. And some of the things that I saw, uh, perhaps a sense of empirehood, if there's such a word. But it was always clear to me that the period of my tenure as governor was a period of a public trust. Clearly defined. A four-year term subject to renewal for another four-year term and no more. It was very clear to me that I don't own the state. And the only thing I could morph into was into a senior citizen after that office. And that is what I chose. Now, as a senior citizen with experience, the only thing I could offer the governor was advice, if he sought it. And it was always going to be how to thread the clear, if your advice is not solicited, your time is up. Go quietly into the night. You're interfering. Yeah, right. If your help or your advice is needed, then you intervene. So did you intervene in the case of Samuelu? Because we saw you in the last two weeks campaigning for him. Is it that the figures of the presidential were so became, close? It, that's not governance anymore. And let me finish that story. Because we've seen some models, people writing letters, telling their successors how to govern. You don't do that. Mm. It's not a king, kingdom. It's a public trust. Your time is up. Mm. If you have advice, there are back channels for dealing with that. And we must copy successful models. When last did you see David Cameron telling Theresa May how to manage Brexit? He led the vote. When last did you see Barack Obama telling uh, Trump. Trump how to govern? We must copy those kind of examples. How many times did Mandela interfere in the day-to-day -day governance of South Africa? So, that's one. Intervention in politics. Look, I'm a member of that party. We have evolved and chosen a candidate to fly our flag in the general election. It's a different rule. I go and campaign for our candidate. That's a different thing. In the way, for example, Barack Obama came out to campaign for Democratic candidates against the Republicans in the last midterm election. Mm -hmm. After that, he's gone back quietly. Right. So it's, it's a different thing. All of us are members of the same party. Right. Let me ask you this. And I know that primaries can be very, very bitter sibling rivalries. Mm. And they require to, because it's an intra-house dispute. Right. And there can be only one winner. So there needs to be a lot of healing when that happens. The recent Amadeg saga it took Lagos by storm, and we didn't understand what was going on. The political class said, oh, the governor didn't fulfill his own obligations to the political class. The average Lagosian says, hey, we see this governor, he's working. He, I mean, we see the basic and amenities being provided for us. We see roads are being built. We see investments and hospitals. So what exactly is the issue here? So in your, in your view, what did he do wrong exactly that caused the rift between him and the political class? Lagos? I think, first of all, um it's not a question of right and wrong. Okay. Uh, um, I think people must also understand that uh, policies have political consequences. Okay. And the political parties are more perceptive than perhaps members of the public give them credit for. Credit for. So they have an intelligence unit filling the polls and what they like to see in the next election and so on and so forth. So that's as much as I, I, I think uh, is useful for our conversation because I really didn't get involved at that level in the, uh, in the goings on uh, because I was also busy mm. in Abuja here. But that said, as the fallouts came, one of the things I was concerned about was that whatever happened, 
right? We must look beyond the occupier of the office to the office. Okay. That is the office that great Nigerians, some of my very illustrious predecessors held. From Bolaji Johnson, the very first governor, albeit unelected. That was the office that men, Europeans like Carter, Glover held. That is the office that Alaji Jacode held. That is the office that Michael Otedola held. Bola Tinumbu held. So nothing must be done to desecrate that office. Right. And whatever differences you have with the holder of the office, that is, the office in itself is our big masquerade. Hmm. And holders come and go, and they leave the shroud of the masquerade intact. Hmm. That, that, that must, so, and that was the role I tried to play. Hmm. And as, as I said earlier, it's a term of four years, subject to the discretion of the public, whether you get another time. Okay, let me um, ask you a bit about the, the ethnic issues going on in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. During your time, you allegedly, according to the reports, that sent some Igbos back home. And you've said that, listen, that never happened. But um, today, the Igbos in Lagos State are saying they are being intimidated to vote for or to support the ruling party. My question to you, sir, what exactly are the Yorubas scared of? I think that, you know, I see Nigerians, unfortunately, and I cannot apologize for the way other people choose to see themselves. Okay. I see Nigerians first and foremost. But, you know, the point that has perhaps agitated my mind was in 2015, when the former president sought to ethnicize our politics. And long before that, no ethnic group had ever held a consensus meeting to say all of us are voting this way. Right. Even amongst the so-called indigenous Yoruba, Awuri, Eko people, They've never been able to mobilize all of their own into one place. They are always dividing groups. Some want to go with the main party, some want to be. So, but that was a concern at the time. But I think that common sense will prevail. Maturity will prevail. Look, we are far too joined at the hip. So this is a Siamese twin surgery that cannot be undertaken the consequences will be devastated. You know, they normally separate the Amis twins. You can't separate this one. The consequences will be so devastating that it is unthinkable to even attempt it. And let us just understand those who are playing it. They are playing it for their own self-interest. Hmm. Let me go to the, to the current deputy governor-elect of Lagos State, Hamzat. We hear he's your friend. We hear he was your selection, you brought him <laughs> in, and um, he's fashola boy, and that's the word on the street. Um, tell us about him. We don't, some of us don't know much about him, and you, you seem to trust him. You seem to say he and someone will make a good team. Tell us a bit about the, about the deputy governor-elect. Let me go back to the beginning. Jide Sowolu joined the cabinet when uh, the deputy governor, Femi Pedro, came to government. Okay. And that was in the running to uh, Governor Tinumbu's re-election. So he was appointed by the governor as a special advisor to the then deputy governor. That's a story. Mm. When we won the re-election, Femi joined us from Oando. He had come from the United States. Right. And I was chief of staff. So I had a relationship with many of them, of them, getting things done. How does this place work? My office was like the go-to place. But both of them distinguished themselves very early. They were my, my age in terms of generation type. We were both in our 50s. And so we, we got on. Uh, 
We just share the same thing. We all went to school around the same time in different parts right. of the world. A generation just comes together. And so and when I became the governor, I kept both of them and challenged them with very difficult assignments, and they delivered. 2023, we hear you might be running for president. Again, I've given you the yardstick by which to proceed. <laughs> so because if you, know, you don't hear from me, it's not it didn't happen. Gotcha. All right. If you don't hear it from me, they, I don't hide. I don't do surreptitious things. Okay. All right. I'm driven by clear convictions about what I think is right, and I deal with them. When you were engaged as the Honorable Minister, I know your principal had asked you to focus on four major projects. That's the Lagos Ivano Expressway, the Second Niger Bridge, uh, the Abuja um, stretch up to Zaria, Kaduna, mm -hmm. and also the Loring, Jebba, and uh, Mokwa Road. How is that going, and where are we right now as of 2019? Well, all of those projects are in... Uh, significant stages of execution. Okay. Work is going on on the Abuja Kanu Highway. Work is going on on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. Work is going on. We finished the first stretch of the Lorne uh, Jeba Road. Uh, work is continuing on the Oyo Bomosho section. We are also expanding from a single lane to a double lane. Right. Uh, dual carriageway, the Loring Jeba Road, and extending the dualization all the way to Mokwa. Right. So we're making progress. Right. Lagosians understand that the Apapa Oshodi Expressway is on the way, but I think many people want to know the timelines we're working with to see the completion of this project. It's a 24 month project okay. from when we are awarded in the last quarter, I think, of 2018. Um, that's the projected delivery time. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is that the contracting firm intends to use double gangs or triple gangs to execute, and they think that they can finish shorter than 24 months. Uh, for those who use that route currently, you will see that we are already setting out. Around Aswani is solo. You will see red and yellow uh, concrete barriers being laid out, preparing to uh, manage, preparing to uh, manage traffic while we build. Mm. Uh, what I know is that most of the production for the materials to be used have already started. Materials have been ordered. Uh, work is going on in batching plants. This is a modern way of construction. Right. So you will see things coming to site when uh, casting is finished. Right. Whilst that is going on, uh, we have also completed works on the Leventis Ijora Bridge. Okay. So you will begin to see some relief in the number of trucks you, mm. you used to see on the road currently on the uh, Funchal Williams Western Avenue right. side towards Costain. Mm. And as this construction goes on, as I've told uh, some residents of it, uh, Papa, that it's not when we finish in 24 months that you will see relief. Mm. Relief will be continued okay. as sections of the road are, are continued. Great. Let me go to issue of housing. You have mm. said that um, currently there are housing projects ongoing in 34 states, which you've said. Mm -hmm. And you've also identified the fact that the issue of low housing costs, low cost of housing, affordable mm -hmm. housing costs, and also the acceptability. Yeah. Now, I've gone around and seen that there are houses. Well, how do we get these people to take these houses and choose a mode of payment that is conducive <coughs> for them? How, what, how, what, are you, what is your ministry doing to close that gap? Um, it's one of the issues I want to address uh, at an event I'll be speaking very soon. And uh, I, I think that um, the housing problem is perhaps the biggest problem we are dealing with in this ministry. Right. Uh, and it's not because it is difficult to build a house, but it is important to have consensus right. around what the problem is. You know, in power, we have consensus about what exactly. the problem is. Right. People want more energy. Yeah. People want more meters. They want estimated billions to stop. So we, we can define the problem. We haven't, as a people, 
properly defined that problem housing. of housing. Right. And people have promised what is impossible. I've heard people say they will build a million houses. I don't know any nation that has built a million houses in one year. Right. And everybody I've asked, they said, somebody said, I said, did you see? <laughs> it's not what somebody right. said. Now, the other problem in housing is, as you have pointed out, affordability, which I've addressed, uh, acceptability, yeah. which I've also addressed. Is this the type of house I, I want? want? Is even where I want it to Exactly. Be. Before we begin to match the cost to my resources and my earnings mm. in order to make it affordable. And is the expectation of the end user also realistic? Uh -huh. If you leave school and within one year you want to live in the most prime area of your city, right. whether it's in the GRA, you don't want to go through a property ladder and move from the outskirts into the center of town as you progress and your earnings improve. Those are matters around which we have to have mm. a national consensus. But one of the things we're looking at, which is quite interesting, is the number of empty houses across Nigeria in every major city that I've been to. And I want to see if I can get all of the professionals, estate valuers, surveyors to help us collect a data mm. that actually determines how many of those houses are empty, where they are, why they are empty, which people want them. Right. And can we develop it? I have something at the back of my okay. mind All right. uh, yeah, we'll that I think can be, can be useful. Okay, let's move yeah. into the issue of power. Um, yeah. We've talked about deregulating the distribution of power, especially the distribution of meters, actually. Yeah. And um, I think we all got excited last year when NERC said, oh, yes, now private companies can yes. begin to be licensed to assemble and distribute. Mm -hmm. But it's been a year now. We are yet to see people actually um, doing this job of distribution, private sector. I'm happy at least we're communicating with you and hopefully from you to a larger audience. Uh, that is policy decision. Before policy translates to results, okay. they take time. And even in the organization that you work, TVC, you have policies. Right. And before they translate to results, there's a gestation, there's a takeoff, and otherwise, we will repeat the mistakes we are trying to solve. Okay, so, when so we've licensed them. Okay. Now they need to work with discos. Okay. Where are your consumers? So consumers too cannot hide. Right. So some people legitimately want meters. Some people don't want to be seen. Mm. And they want to connect. Gotcha. Okay. And that is the next phase okay. we're dealing with. We still had a meeting about it this week. So everything we commit to, we are monitoring right. and managing so that we can s deliver the results that we see and that the public expects. All right. I know you have a 10-year plan. Um, you, you told us that your administration has developed a 10-year plan. To achieve what exactly? What should we see in 10 years' time? No, we don't have a 10-year plan in general. Okay. Uh, what I think I said was that the kind of expectations that we want to see across Nigeria usually takes about a decade okay. to happen. But you will begin to see the signs as they evolve. Within my own ministry, I can tell you, for example, that after four years, or almost four years, going to what we have campaigned about, mm. the next level, what you will begin to see from my ministry in power, for example, is Continued incremental power, you will see that. Right. In some places now, we will be able to deliver steady power. Right. Okay. In some places. Some places. And, 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 and for yeah. example, now in places like Kebi, right. in places like uh, Damaturu, Meduguri, people are getting almost 24 hour power. Hmm. In some places, it is 18. In some places, it is 5. Some people yet don't have. Right. Now, how do we do that? We're completing a few power plants, like the Kashimbila, Kaduna power plant, Afan power plant, um, and a couple of others mm. will complete this year. So that will increase power. What is the problem that increased power imposes? It imposes the challenge of distribution. 
we have a distribution expansion program okay. uh, where we are injecting, we have approval to spend, I need to be careful, we have approval of the federal executive to spend 72 billion naira as our own investment in the discos to help supply distribution equipment, meters, uh, 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 transformers, mm. breakers, ring main units, new lines, and all of those things that inhibit our ability to evacuate about 2,000 megawatts, which we expect to also increase when we complete more power plants. As the Ninth Assembly is constituted now, and um, your party obviously has majority, what are some of the laws that will enable your work better? For example, you've always complained about the issue of procurement, the process. Uh, the people have complained about the fact that certain rules should be state-owned, not federal-owned. There have been issues of, oh, should it be in the, this list or that list? In your own view, what are the laws that would help your work easier to deliver to the people? Well, the procurement law is one law, uh, and it's important for a nation that has to urgently renew, replace, and build infrastructure to do so very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Because global economic dynamics are not static. And therefore, within the framework of what we can see, right. we need to act decisively, shorten procurement time, shorten procurement processes, so that we can commit quickly and do with today's money what today's money can buy. Right. Because some of the projects we are completing now were projects started yesterday, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when the exchange rate was not this high, when the value of the Naira was a lot higher, mm. but which is finishing at today's money. Right. That's a very important matter around which... Uh, but apart from legislation, there must also, I hope that in the Ninth Assembly, we will have a consensus about some things we can no longer afford to play with. We cannot politicize those things. We must have a consensus across party lines. Right. And one of those things is that we must urgently address national infrastructure. Mm. That is what gives everybody relief. Mm. More power, more rail, more road networks, more airports. Nobody should toy with those things. Mm. Anybody who has any other special projects must seek to achieve them without compromising those ones. Those okay. ones. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Um, that's all we can take on the show. Have a fabulous day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.